Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Susan Elliott, and I'm the president and CEO of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy. And I'd like to welcome all of you to today's program, Washington uh, to Tigre, U.S. Strategy in the Horn of Africa. We at the National Committee think this is an extremely timely and important issue for the United States, given the conflict and violence we've witnessed in Ethiopia since late 2020. So we're very pleased to have a distinguished panel of experts today to engage in our discussion. Most of you know the panelists very well, so I'm not going to spend much time introducing them, but I'd like to at least give you a brief introduction uh, to outline a few of their many accomplishments. As I told them before the panel started, if I listed all their accomplishments, that would take the full hour of the program. But uh, one of the things the three of them have in common, other than knowing a lot about U.S. foreign policy, is that they've all served as U.S. ambassadors to countries in Africa. So I'll start first with Ambassador Johnny Carson, who is a former Foreign Service officer and colleague of mine and currently serves as a senior advisor to the United States Institute of Peace. And before he joined USIP, Ambassador Carson was Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, and he had a very distinguished 37-year Foreign Service career with more than one ambassadorship. He was ambassador to Kenya, Zimbabwe, and Uganda. We also have Ambassador Michelle Gavin, who is currently a senior fellow for African Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. And she also has many years of experience in international affairs in government and in nonprofit roles. She was formerly managing director of the Africa Center and in, uh, from 2011 to 2014, she was US Ambassador to Botswana. Um, and the moderator of today's discussion, who I think for our members of the National Committee no, needs no introduction, is Ambassador Herman Cohen, better known to most of us as Hank. Ambassador Cohen is a longtime member and supporter of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy. And Ambassador Cohen, uh, as we all know, has devoted his entire professional career to African and European affairs. And he also had a very long and distinguished career in the US Foreign Service. And he really has not only been Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, but served in the NSC and has seen many uh, peaceful and helped actually to bring many peaceful transitions of power, not only in, around the African continent, in South Africa, Nambia, and, um, and conflicts in Angola, Ethiopia, and Mozambique. So I can think of no better person to moderate today's discussion. And before I turn the program over to Ambassador Cohen, just let me give a few um, technical uh, bit, bits of information. We encourage all participants to ask questions. We'll start out with a, a dialogue among our participants, and then uh, we encourage you to type your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. We will monitor that, and then uh, probably in, after about the pro halfway through the program, we'll begin to take questions from uh, people in our audience. You know, many of you, and I welcome many of you who are not uh, longtime members and supporters of the National Committee, so we are recording today's program, which is on the record. The recording of the program will be available at our website, which we will put uh, in the chat function so you can see how to get there. And so you can view the program again or recommend it to others. And we always also encourage you to look at our website and see the work that we do. We not only um, host informative public programs like this, but we have a variety of private programs where we do track two discussions with many uh, countries and uh, friends in conflict around the world. So with that, I'll turn the discussion over to Ambassador Cohen and thanks again to everyone for participating in today's discussion. Thank you very much, Ambassador Elliott. It's a great pleasure to be back here with, uh, with the NCAFP. Uh, I, I also want to say good morning to our American friends and colleagues and good afternoon to our friends and colleagues in East Africa who may be watching and to our Muslim friends and colleagues. I want to say Ramadan Mubarak uh, for this very important holiday. So uh, the Horn of Africa is a place of considerable instability. And I think uh, the Secretary of State recognize that and by sending recently sending 
a Senator Coons to talk about the terrible tragedy that's now going on in Ethiopia, where many, many civilians are dying in the war and many more are even being displaced. Uh, I've been cautioned about what I say about Ethiopia because I gather that both sides have uh, journalists on their payrolls. So it may be more dire than, than what we're seeing, but generally it's quite a serious problem. So, and then of course we have violence going on in South Sudan and in Sudan in the Darfur area. And in Somalia, of course, we have a long-standing terrorist threat from uh, Al-Shabaab. So it's quite a, an active uh, sub-region of Africa that I think is worthy of analysis and study. So I would like to start asking uh, Ambassador Carson, what's your take on Ethiopia now? H how serious is this problem of, of warfare going on there? Thank you very much, uh, Hank, for the question. And thank you for inviting me to this uh, discussion this morning. I'll start uh, uh, by saying that uh, any remarks I make are my own remarks and don't represent those of any professional organization with which I'm uh, associated. Uh, I think the situation uh, in Ethiopia uh, is uh, extraordinarily complex, uh, fragile, uh, and important for the international community to be monitoring and watching. Uh, as many people realize, uh, Ethiopia is one of the most important countries in Africa. It's the second most populous country with a population uh, of, of, of uh, in excess of 115 uh, million uh, people. It sits astride the uh, Red Sea, which is one of the most important uh, arteries, uh, maritime arteries in, in the world, linking uh, Europe uh, and, uh, uh, and Asia, uh, the Middle East and Europe uh, as, uh, as well. Uh, Ethiopia has been going through for the last two and a half years, a very complex political transition, uh, which many of us look at as historic and one which could move the country from uh, 30 years of autocracy, possibly uh, into a more uh, democratic uh, and liberal trajectory. That transformation has been thrown uh, dramatically off course uh, in the last uh, six months because of the conflict uh, in Tigray province uh, in the northern part of Ethiopia. Uh, since November of 2020, uh, that uh, province uh, has uh, suffered uh, calamitous uh, uh, human rights uh, violations, uh, uh, military uh, actions, uh, which have virtually uh, destroyed the country and certainly left 80% uh, of the population, some 4.5 million people uh, in enormous humanitarian uh, distress. Uh, Ethiopia uh, is uh, now facing a horrendous uh, humanitarian crisis uh, in uh, Tigray province uh, and the crisis and the fighting that has been going on there since uh, last uh, November uh, jeopardizes the, both the political and the economic uh, progress and promise of the, of the country. It also uh, has the impact of drawing in countries from uh, the uh, region into this conflict. Uh, Eritrean soldiers have been involved in some of the uh, battles and the human rights abuses that have occurred in Tigray and Ethiopia and Sudan are currently having uh, difficulties along their uh, respective border. Uh, so the situation there is quite serious. It demands international attention. It demands the attention, uh, high level and continuous attention of officials uh, in Washington and also at the UN in New York. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Carson. Uh, Ambassador Gavin, you wanna uh, comment on that uh, specifically uh, you know that uh, right next door in Somalia, you have the Al-Shabaab terrorists running around. Do you think uh, the problem in Ethiopia could uh, spill over into places like Somalia and vice versa? Well, I certainly think uh, that instability in Ethiopia uh, only promises more instability in Somalia. For many years, Ethiopia was kind of an exporter of security, sending troops uh, 
to Somalia, to South Sudan. Uh, and so the Shabaab element is, is interesting. And right now, Somalia is in the midst of its own very, very dangerous political crisis. Uh, but I think that you know the notion of uh, an Ethiopian state uh, falling apart at the seams, uh, unable to uh, play the same kind of uh, security guarantor that it, it role that it had played historically does not bode well for the situation in Somalia, nor does the ascendance of uh, Eritrea's influence in the region. It's clear, as Ambassador Carson mentioned, that Eritrean troops have been involved in the, the Ethiopian conflict. It's equally clear uh, that Eritrea is becoming a more influential actor in Somalia and in, in some ways um, supporting a kind of dangerous uh, uh, consolidation of power on the part of the, the nominal president of Somalia whose mandate uh, already expired. So I think that uh, the political dynamics in the region are complex, but very clearly interrelated. And, and right now, all of these trend lines lead toward more instability uh, for, for both Ethiopia and Somalia. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Ambassador Carson, as was already mentioned, uh, President Biden sent a delegation to Ethiopia uh, to see what could be done. He sent Senator Coons. And uh, when Senator Coons came back, uh, we noticed that the, the government of Ethiopia loosened up a little bit. They allowed more humanitarian aid to come in. Uh, what would you say are the policy implications for the Biden administration? Would you make recommendations that uh, they, they take a, play a bigger role uh, in, in that conflict? Let me just say, I applaud the uh, efforts that have been undertaken so far uh, by the uh, Biden administration. Uh, we not only saw uh, the White House dispatch Senator Coons uh, to the region to speak with Prime Minister Abi about uh, withdrawal of uh, Eritrean troops and opening up humanitarian access and working towards a ceasefire, but we've also seen some other positive steps uh, by the administration. Uh, Secretary of State Tony Blinken uh, called Prime Minister uh, Abe uh, some two or three weeks ago. We saw the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, just last week speak to the Deputy Prime Minister uh, in uh, Ethiopia about the crisis. We have seen uh, Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield uh, in New York uh, pushing the Security Council to take up the uh, issue of uh, of, uh, of, of Ethiopia uh, before the council. Uh, and uh, we have seen uh, an orchestrated statement uh, pushed by the United States uh, among the G7 uh, countries uh, pushing uh, for a number of things. Uh, it is absolutely key uh, that the administration uh, keep this uh, as a major uh, priority. Uh, it needs to continue to insist uh, upon uh, the withdrawal of all Eritrean uh, troops. It must insist upon greater humanitarian access uh, into uh, the region uh, of, uh, of, of Tigray. Uh, it um, must uh, also uh, push uh, very, very uh, hard uh, for a uh, dialogue uh, uh, between uh, those uh, individuals uh, who are in power in Tigray uh, from the former TPLF. There must be an inclusive dialogue that resolves this. There must also be accountability uh, for those who have carried out uh, these e enormous uh, war crimes and atrocities that have occurred uh, in the, the, the region. Uh, it uh, does require additional uh, things that can be done. Uh, I think it is important uh, that we push to, to get the UN Secretary General, uh, Antonio Guterres, uh, out there. It's important uh, that uh, both uh, Secretary Blinken and uh, NSC Director Sullivan, and even the, the President or the Vice President, uh, speak to Abe and continue to, to press for the kinds of uh, uh, issues that we think are, are most uh, important. Uh, and uh, we uh, need 
fundamentally to see accountability for all of the atrocities that have occurred uh, in Tigray province, uh, some of which uh, are absolutely uh, uh, horrendous uh, in nature. All of this needs to be done in conjunction with our European allies and working with the AU. Thank you, Ambassador Carson. Uh, Ambassador Gavin, uh, what's happening in Ethiopia also raises the issue of uh, ethnic nationalism. Do, do you think that uh, ethnic nationalism is a growing uh, issue for U.S. foreign policy? I think I think that it it may well be. Um, certainly, in in Ethiopia, this question of ethnic nationalism and, and of ethnic federalism, right, is kind of the fundamental political question. Uh, on the table. And when the TPLF uh, lost control over the ruling coalition that governed the entire country, uh, the, the kind of contestation uh, among these different um, nationally or ethnically based parties um, became that much more uh, intense um, and the rules of the game a bit undefined because it was clear that the prime minister wanted to move uh, away to some degree from the ethnic federalist model that had governed Ethiopia for some time. So I, I do think that uh, in the Ethiopian case, there's a sort of very specific political history behind this and that any kind of inclusive dialogue as Ambassador Carson suggested is really gonna have to help define the terms of um, this fundamental question about uh, the nature of ethnically based political parties, ethnically based sort of sub-regions of the country. And if, if that really does need to be the orchestrating principle going forward, but more broadly, as you bring up South Sudan and, and other parts of the region, I do think what it points to is the importance of uh, inclusive political processes and really taking um, the measures of social trust in a country more seriously as we think about conflict prevention and early warning. And there, there is some good you know, social science that's helping us to, to better uh, get a hold on where social trust is at in a given society. And I, I think it's pointing towards, towards some important tools for diplomats to use um, to try and get out ahead of some of these problems and try and encourage the types of inclusive dialogues and processes um, that can hopefully lead away from, from conflict. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ambassador Carson, uh, in, uh, in, in addition to the problem of Tigray, uh, the Ethiopian government also has the problem of, of this major dam that it just finished in construction, what they call the Renaissance Dam. And in filling the dam, it's apparently going to deprive Egypt and Sudan of water that they need very badly from the Blue Nile. So uh, President Trump uh, attempted to uh, mediate in this and it didn't go very far. Do you think that this is an issue that's, that's worthy of uh, the American government's attention right now, in addition to the violence that's going on? The, uh, the GERD, as it is called, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance uh, Dam, uh, is uh, a significant uh, development uh, project uh, that has captivated uh, and united uh, the people of, uh, of, of Ethiopia. There is no question uh, that uh, both Egypt uh, and Sudan are uh, very much uh, concerned uh, about the uh, filling of this dam and what it will mean for water uh, supplies uh, going to uh, Sudan uh, and to uh, Egypt. Uh, over uh, the last uh, two uh, and a half years, uh, there have been uh, trilateral negotiations uh, between uh, the three countries uh, on the filling of the dam, uh, as well as the, uh, how the waters from the dam uh, will be used. Uh, the uh, Trump administration took a very direct uh, role uh, in trying to resolve the dispute between these three countries, and in so doing, diplomatically mismanaged and mishandled uh, the problem. Uh, the uh, Trump uh, administration 
uh, sought to uh, push an agreement uh, that favored uh, the Egyptian uh, position uh, and diminished uh, the Ethiopian uh, position. Uh, and uh, when Ethiopia refused uh, to go along with the U.S. position, the U.S. imposed uh, sanctions uh, on uh, Ethiopia, uh, cutting off uh, some nearly uh, 250 to 300 million uh, dollars uh, in development uh, assistance. Uh, this uh, was the wrong uh, approach. Uh, in fact, uh, this uh, angered uh, the uh, Ethiopians and in part has somewhat diminished uh, our influence uh, in uh, that country. There is uh, no doubt that the one thing that unites Ethiopians today uh, is the completion uh, and the sovereignty over that dam. But it is important uh, to ensure uh, that the other riparian states receive their share of water. I think that the posture which is currently there is the one which is the one that is most effective. The AU chairmanship uh, under uh, 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 President Sheshikedi um, in uh, the Congo, is uh, facilitating uh, negotiations uh, between the three and the US, uh, the EU, uh, <coughs> and the African Union are all uh, as observers. The US uh, should be prepared to provide uh, technical uh, advice uh, and assistance, uh, but it should not in fact uh, seek to impose uh, a solution. Uh, its uh, advice uh, and assistance is uh, very helpful, I think, but uh, it should in fact uh, be uh, worked out uh, through the three countries with the support of the, uh, of the uh, international community acting uh, as, uh, as technical advisors and assistants in the, in the process. Uh, the current Biden administration has pulled back on some of the sanctions that were leveled by the Trump administration. Uh, uh, on the dam, and I think uh, that was a wise move, but uh, our mishandling uh, of the diplomacy around the dam uh, in the last year, particularly of the Trump administration, uh, wrong-footed the United States and has put us at a disadvantage in trying to uh, help uh, straighten out the current conflict in Tigray. Yes, thank you for that. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but on te television, we saw former President Trump in a conversation with President Kenyatta. And he was talking about the dam. And he said, if that isn't solved, the Egyptians are going to bomb it. So that, that caused kind of a stir there. Well, let me just say, if I could, there has been an increase uh, in uh, talk uh, about military uh, action by Egypt uh, against uh, Ethiopia uh, because of the, uh, the dam. Uh, I think that would be a very costly uh, political and a military mistake for uh, the uh, Egyptians to undertake any uh, military uh, action towards Ethiopia to resolve this. This should re be resolved uh, around the negotiating table uh, with intense discussions with technical uh, advisors on the side to provide uh, fair, uh, balanced, and impartial. Uh, views as to uh, what is being discussed by the political parties at hand. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, let's switch from the Blue Nile over to the White Nile, uh, which also has its problems, uh, especially in South Sudan, uh, Ambassador Gavin. Uh, next July, South Sudan will celebrate its 10th anniversary of independence. And throughout this period, as far as I can tell, it's been total instability. There's been a lot of ethnic conflict, a lot of fighting and killing. Uh, what do you think the prospects are in South Sudan? I wish I could be um, more optimistic than I am, uh, uh, candidly, about South Sudan. Um, in part, there's just such an abject failure of leadership uh, that the country is, is saddled with. So there's uh, you're quite right, um, recurrent episodes of instability. There's also very compelling evidence of 
a tremendous amount of brand corruption, uh, this in a, in a society where many people are desperately impoverished. Um, and I'm just skeptical uh, that, uh, that the current leadership is, is uh, ready to change course or be terribly responsive to the international community. Now that said, I think it's important to note that there, are, there have been uh, initiatives um, taking place as more at a civil society level uh, to try and kind of come up with uh, some shared uh, aspirations and objectives for where the people of South Sudan would like to see their country go. And I think that is a positive step that the dialogue process uh, that was undertaken over several years uh, did yield some interesting, um, some interesting findings and uh, I think maybe gave some hint of how uh, that society could move forward. Right now, power, however, is not really in the hands of, of uh, uh, civilians who necessarily have the, the best interests of the entire country at heart. Yeah, so uh, some time ago, I met a Swedish uh, army colonel who was visiting here, and he had served in South Sudan as part of the UN peacekeeping. And he said that the South Sudan army has 200 generals. That's oh. more than the whole US army has. So it's a sign of, uh, you know, of what's going on. It's unfortunate because uh, we had so much hope for, the, for South Sudan and, and President Bush 43 worked so hard uh, to bring about the, their independence. Just, so, just quickly, to be fair, I think it is, you know, just to be fair, it is important to note what an incredibly traumatized society that is. And, and you're quite right, there was a, an extraordinary diplomatic effort um, to get to the point where the entire international community and authorities in Khartoum um, acquiesced to a, a self-determination exercise. Uh, but over the course of that time, there was a big leadership change in South Sudan too. And, and uh, I think that has a lot to do with the country's trajectory. Yeah, I, I kind of feel that uh, they never had the benefit of colonialism, really. Mm. Uh, I remember reading the last British governor of Sudan never visited South Sudan. He never went to Juba. Can you imagine that? Spending mm. all his time as governor of Sudan, never been going there. So we're also talking about a long period of neglect. Okay, well, uh, Ambassador Carson, then there's another issue that's raising its ugly head here because of uh, what they call ethnic cleansing in Tigray, because there seems to be a lot of sexual violence. You get the impression that uh, there is uh, some of the military in Tigray are under orders to, to rape the women and kill the young men. Uh, this may be uh, propaganda coming out of uh, TPLF, but uh, there seems to be growing evidence that, that rape has become a, an element of warfare. Uh, would you agree with that? Uh, yes. Uh, as I said earlier, there have been uh, numerous uh, confirmed uh, and unconfirmed uh, reports of uh, war crimes, uh, human rights violations, uh, atrocities, uh, and rape. Uh, rape in uh, the northern part of uh, the country in Tigray appears to uh, have been uh, a weapon of war. Uh, and uh, there are increasing number of reports uh, coming out uh, that confirm uh, many of the uh, worst uh, stories that, uh, that, we've, uh, that we've heard. Uh, there seems in many ways to be uh, a, a systematic effort uh, underway uh, to punish uh, and cripple uh, the people and region of uh, Tigray. Uh, the uh, reports uh, of Eritrean troops uh, going into the region uh, and uh, killing uh, civilians, uh, destroying uh, uh, assets, uh, burning houses, churches, buildings, uh, hotels, uh, and uh, destroying uh, economic uh, assets uh, has been uh, absolutely uh, appalling. Uh, the Eritrean troops uh, who have gone in 
uh, have also reportedly destroyed, according to the United Nations, two of the four uh, UNHCR supported refugee camps that formerly uh, housed uh, Eritrean uh, refugees uh, who had escaped uh, from uh, the brutality uh, of uh, President uh, Isaiah uh, Afawaki. Uh, there is no uh, question uh, that uh, uh, Tigray uh, today uh, is suffering from an enormous uh, humanitarian uh, crisis. Uh, some four and a half million people are in need of food uh, and uh, medical uh, attention. That's roughly 80% uh, uh, of the people uh, of, that, uh, of, of that area. Uh, clearly, uh, the uh, fighting between the two armies has ended in that area, uh, but uh, what is evolving in Tigray appears uh, to be a sustained low intensity conflict that could in fact go on uh, for weeks, months uh, into the uh, future. Uh, the situation there is serious and rape has been used uh, as a weapon of war. It should be condemned uh, by all and those who are responsible should be held accountable. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Gatman, uh, let's take another look at Somalia. You know, the, the Al-Shabaab came out of something that they call the Islamic courts. I think this was back in uh, around 2006. And uh, they've been running around Somalia, taking money from the people, buying arms, uh, occasionally doing suicide bombings in, in the capital city of Mogadishu. And although Somalia has made a lot of progress in, uh, in electing, electing a president and uh, establishing some sort of a, a civilian government, they can't seem to cope with Al-Shabaab. Is there anything that the international community can do there, in your opinion? I think the international community has invested a great deal uh, in Somalia and its uh, incredibly slow slog toward more stability. Um, and right now, uh, even more international attention uh, needs to be focused on, on this political crisis. So I think that there's been a tremendous effort to try and help with the, on the counterterrorism side of the equation. Um, with some success, limited success, but with some success. But uh, the, the slower going really has been on the, the political side um, to try and kind of build some consensus uh, around uh, how power is allocated and shared in that society and who is responsible for which needs of the population. Uh, so I, I actually think a lot more attention on the political strategy, which right now is, is floundering terribly uh, given president and parliament's decision to extend their terms for two years, which is highly unlikely to be accepted by the opposition and, and has already been called unacceptable by the international community. It, it, it's really, you know, Shabab is able uh, to, to gain some support, to continue to get new recruits, um, because uh, in some parts of Somalia, they're the only game in town. Um, and because uh, governance uh, such as it is, is not engendered a, a great deal of support and trust. So I'm not in any way suggesting that one abandon the counterterrorism mission, but uh, there has to be a political strategy moving uh, in parallel. I see. Well, you know, I was uh, assistant secretary when the former dictator, the late dictator Siad Bar was overthrown. Mm -hmm. uh, it was 1991. So the question is what came after? And there was a series of conferences among the different political groupings of Somalia held in Djibouti. And I remember going there for one of the conferences to encourage them, you know, to, to come up with a, a, a viable solution. And I remember it was, uh, and you know, Djibouti is a, is a country that's usually very hot and humid, one of the worst in the world. And that day that I, while I was there, it was a very nice low 80s, low humidity. And I said to the US ambassador, is, this must be the winter time here if, uh, if it's such a nice weather. He says, yes, Djibouti has one day of winter per year and this is it today. <laughs> so, <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, of course, as you all know, Djibouti has an American base, uh, which is uh, very important to us. And it, it has implications for our naval base in Diego Garcia. So uh, I think Djibouti is an element of stability uh, in the Horn of Africa. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, Ambassador Carson, what do you think? I, yes, I think uh, it, Djibouti is uh, an important uh, place uh, for the United States, but it's also an important place uh, for uh, the uh, international community. Uh, as I said uh, earlier, the Red Sea Arena uh, is, uh, is a vital maritime uh, artery uh, that uh, is used uh, to uh, ship goods from Asia uh, to Europe and from Europe uh, into the Asia Pacific uh, arena. Uh, it uh, begins at the Suez Canal and it ends at the uh, Barab Mendeb uh, Straits. And uh, some uh, seven uh, you know, billion dollars worth of goods flow through that, uh, that, uh, that area. Djibouti has been home uh, to uh, a French military base for many, many years. Uh, the US has a facility there. But increasingly, we have seen uh, China, uh, Japan, uh, and other uh, countries uh, also uh, set up uh, facilities there uh, in order to ensure uh, freedom of navigation uh, and the freedom of maritime uh, commerce. It is an important waterway. It's an important waterway, not just for the Horn of Africa uh, and for uh, the region, but for the global community. And I think Djibouti uh, has been uh, the uh, most reliable and stable place for uh, international uh, navies to operate from. Uh, and uh, their presence there uh, does, in fact, uh, ensure uh, the stability of that uh, and openness of, uh, of that uh, waterway. International commerce is important for all of us. Djibouti has been a friend in helping to secure it. I would agree. And, and as you will recall, there was a bad a problem of piracy uh, at the mouth of the Red Sea. And, and, and US uh, Navy people from Djibouti actually put a stop to that. Uh, so it, it's another element of why Djibouti is important. Uh, to the it was an international, I might add, it was, a, it was an international uh, effort uh, that uh, the U.S. Uh, and our European uh, partners uh, were in, uh, involved in, but it was also one in which uh, China also played uh, a role uh, and led uh, to China opening its first uh, uh, overseas military base uh, in Djibouti as a part of the anti-piracy effort uh, in the Red Sea arena. Well, that's a great... Uh item for cooperation in US-China. You know, look, look, look what's going on in West Africa now off uh, in the Gulf of Guinea. We're, we're getting quite a, quite a bit of piracy there, but that's yes. a discussion from another day. Mm. Okay, why don't we go to audience questions? Uh, let me start, I'm a, you're not surprised when I say that a lot of questions are coming from people with Ethiopian names. Mm. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, here's one from Teshai Tefera. He says, in the absence of an agreement in the UN Security Council on any action on Ethiopia and Eritrea, on their actions in Tigray, shouldn't the US and the European Union intervene unilaterally to stop the atrocities going on in, in Tigray? In other words, is there sort of a Holocaust going on in Tigray? Shouldn't we do more about it? How about that, Ambassador Gavin? Well, you know, I think that the Biden administration certainly has been focusing more and more attention on uh, the crisis in Tigray, expressing concern, but I am sympathetic to the questioner's point that uh, expressions of concern and phone calls do nothing to protect people um, who are at risk of atrocities. Uh, you know, is it, is it inconceivable to imagine any kind of multilateral uh, intervention. I, I don't think that it's inconceivable. I also don't think it's um, in the, the near offing. So obviously a tremendously complex and, and risky undertaking that 
you know, uh, done the wrong way can make situations far worse and actually create even more instability. So I, I think that, you know, in at this point and in this instance, uh, the most uh, likely and most important uh, strategy is to continue to build a multilateral coalition, uh, including in critical actors in the Gulf and in the Middle East who are influential in Ethiopia, um, and to the extent possible, uh, trying to uh, bring the Chinese uh, into the fold, given what we were just discussing, which is a shared uh, interest in stability in the region. All of our interests don't align, um, but some of them do. Uh, to try and uh, convince uh, the authorities in Ethiopia and in neighboring states uh, that the violence has to stop. There is uh, an investigation into some of the human rights abuses uh, underway. Um, we'll see how credible that is. There are some very credible actors who are part of it. Uh, and then there's going to have to be a demand for accountability. I see. Uh, you know, I, I have a blog where I do a, a Twitter feed five days a week. And uh, a week ago, I, I just threw out an idea. I said, why doesn't the Ethiopian government give free passage to the TPLF leadership and let them leave the country. And, then, and, and if they're willing to leave Ethiopia and go to some other place and wait a while, and then they could declare a ceasefire. Well, this caused a, quite a stir in the Ethiopian diaspora here. And, I, and they said, well, we're gonna take it up with, uh, with uh, Prime Minister Abiy, but uh, I haven't seen any, any real follow-up. So I have the impression that unless the TPLF is totally destroyed, the Prime Minister Abbey is not going to feel safe. Uh, it, it's really an idea. We got to really destroy that movement. Okay, here's a question here again. It says, how can the Ethiopian Prime Minister accept to engage in an inclusive dialogue with TPLF leaders without appearing to lose face, thus encouraging rebellions in other regions of the country? You know. If he, if he appeases the TPLF, will the Oromos start giving trouble? How about that, Ambassador Carson? What do you think? Uh, the Prime Minister uh, Abe uh, is in the uh, process of, uh, of engineering uh, a uh, complex and historical uh, transition uh, in that country. Uh, one uh, that has been based on uh, ethnic uh, federalism, uh, ethno-linguistic uh, federalism, uh, to one uh, that is more uh, nationalist and pluralistic. Uh, I think uh, the challenge uh, for uh, him uh, is to uh, help uh, develop a, a system uh, which uh, brings uh, and includes uh, more inclusivity in the, in the process. Uh, I think it has to be uh, done carefully, uh, balanced well. Uh, Tigray uh, clearly uh, is uh, a, a complex uh, problem in and of itself, uh, but uh, Ethiopia today uh, is faced uh, with a number of uh, the tense uh, inter-ethnic uh, rivalries that have uh, begun uh, to surface. While we have seen conflict in Tigray, we know uh, and have seen conflict between the Oromo uh, and the uh, Amhara communities. We have uh, seen conflict uh, uh, between the Amhara uh, and the Tigrinyan uh, speaking uh, communities. We have seen conflict between the Oromo uh, and the Somali uh, communities. Uh, it is important to look for a political solution that uh, involves a, a dialogue that brings uh, people uh, together uh, and diminishes uh, some of these ethnic linguistic conflicts uh, that uh, are bubbling uh, around the nation. I see. Uh, I gather that the main problem on the dam is the is the rate of, of filling. 
uh, if the uh, Egyptians, of course, the Sudanese would say, well, look, why don't you take 11 years to fill it? You know, that will minimize the amount of water that we lose. And the uh, Ethiopians are saying, yeah, well, well, we need that electricity, for, you know, to develop our country for industry and what have you. And we, we have to do it in a minimum of three years. And uh, so I, I had the idea the other day of uh, US companies, which, which I've been working for to build power generators in Africa, they could build quickly electric power generators in Addis, uh, not in Addis, but in Ethiopia general, to tide them over if they agree to a slow fill. That's just something I, I, might, I might wanna pursue because uh, I've worked uh, to build five electric power generators in Africa already, and I think, and when I tried to do it with the Meles government in, uh, in Ethiopia, they said, no, we don't want any outsiders building our power generators, but now that Meles is gone, uh, maybe, maybe they could change. Okay, uh, let me, let me uh, take another question. Uh, in November of 2020, when the Eritrean army was committing a massacre in Aksum, the former Secretary of State and his Assistant Secretary for Africa were thanking the Eritrean government for not being drawn to the Ethiopian conflict. I, do you think they were not aware of the presence of the Eritrean army in Tigray? Uh, do you think the statement emboldened the Eritreans? Well, this, this leads to the general question of why do you think, what is the objective of the Eritreans in, uh, in this conflict? Well, why did they intervene, do you think? So, yeah. Revenge, <laughs> history, <laughs> history and revenge. Um, you know, the, the Tigrayans were at the, the forefront of the fighting in the Ethiopian Eritrean war. Um, there is a, a sense of uh, unsettled accounts um, and a tremendous amount of personal animosity uh, between the Eritrean leadership and senior members of the TPLF. I think that President Isaias has opportunistically seized on an important transition in Ethiopia where it was untenable for an ethnic minority to retain the kind of uh, controlling grip over the entire country that the TPLF had enjoyed for some time um, and has you know, seized on this moment uh, both to exact revenge and to increase uh, Eritrean influence in the region, undermining the norms that he does not care to adhere to, like anything involving uh, accountability from leadership, any kind of connective tissue between citizens and who's actually in charge of their future basic human rights norms, um, and sees this as an opportunity to, to undermine those norms and expand uh, the influence of Eritrea and his preferred norms, which are kind of a, a militarized authoritarianism. I see. Uh, Ambassador uh, Carson, there's the issue of a possible federal system for Ethiopia. You know, the when the TPLF took power in 1991, they established these states or provinces based on ethnicity, but these states did not have any autonomy at all or any power at all like the American states or Nigerian states. They were all under the total control uh, of the TPLF. I remember I, had, I made some friends in the Somali region uh, of Ethiopia. And they told me when they, they had an election, they knew the results one week before, before the election because the TPLF had rigged everything. Do you feel that Ethiopia would really be better off with a true federal system with every uh, state or province having, having their own government and their own power over budgets and that sort of thing, Just like Nigeria, for example? I think that the system that uh, Ethiopia uh, deserves is a system that the people of Ethiopia should decide upon. Uh, I think that uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, a number of uh, individuals uh, have called for uh, an inclusive uh, dialogue in the country to help shape the political future uh, that uh, a majority of uh, Ethiopians uh, should have. 
uh, I think that uh, the system uh, can take uh, different uh, forms, but fundamentally uh, it should be uh, a democratic uh, system where the rights of uh, individuals uh, are protected uh, fully and where there is a broad inclusivity of, of women uh, and children uh, and different ethnic groups uh, on an equal basis. Uh, I think that uh, Prime Minister Abiy uh, has been in the process of trying to engineer a transition away from a system uh, which is based uh, entirely uh, on uh, ethnicity uh, and uh, linguistics to a system in which uh, uh, ideas, uh, values, uh, principles, and party, uh, national party politics uh, dominate. Uh, it's a, a, a difficult uh, transition, but I don't uh, want to uh, prejudge where uh, the Ethiopian people uh, should want their uh, system to go, I would uh, make a strong pitch that whatever the system, it should be one uh, that is democratic and respects the rights uh, of uh, individuals, uh, allows for uh, freedom of religion, speech, uh, association, uh, assembly, uh, and redress to government for wrongs. Uh, Ambassador Gavin, what about the future of the TPLF? Okay, they ruled Ethiopia as an authoritarian government for 29 years. And, uh, and a lot, some people will say that the current problem in Tigray started with them. Uh, they actually started the fighting. Uh, in, in the future, Ethiopia, after peace is restored, does the TPLF have a role or should they be prohibited? You know, like the Nazi party is prohibited in Germany, something like that. Well, I think that uh, any actor who can is, is proven to have been responsible for human rights abuses, um, you know, ought to be held accountable for for those crimes. And so, you know, that that's a whole basket of actors, not all on one side of this conflict, right? And, and it, accountability is essential across the board, not just for um, those who don't emerge victorious in any given conflict. Then there's the question of what the people of Tigray want in terms of their political representation. And I do think that it's, um, you know, as Ambassador Carson indicated, Im important that they have some voice, right, in uh, describing, you know, what kind of um, local and regional uh, leadership makes sense. Uh, so certainly the history of the TPLF is fraught and complex, um, but I don't think that it's, uh, that it makes sense to suggest that the government and the current government in Addis Ababa sort of decides what political arrangements um, make sense. It's going to take some, you know, citizen input uh, combined with moving bad actors off the table through accountability processes to sort of see, see where we land. Uh, we don't have much time left and I don't want to finish without talking about Uganda, where Ambassador Carson was the ambassador. And, you know, they just had a presidential election, which was kind of uh, tumultuous. Uh, the main opposition leader was put in jail and there were all sorts of harassment going on. Uh, and you know President Museveni very well. Uh, my first post uh, in Africa was Uganda, but it was still British colony and I made friends with Idi Amin, that sort of thing. Uh, what, what's your prognosis for Uganda? Do you think it'll do well? I think that the last of uh, elections uh, which uh, provided uh, President uh, Museveni with a sixth uh, term uh, in office uh, were not uh, the kind of uh, elections uh, that one uh, would uh, readily uh, call uh, transparent uh, and uh, free and fair. Uh, the, uh, the main opposition uh, candidate, along with a number of others, uh, were uh, harassed uh, and arrested, uh, humiliated, uh, humiliated uh, and, uh, and embarrassed uh, in the run-up to uh, the election. Uh, 
there uh, was a uh, shutdown of uh, social media uh, and the uh, internet uh, in the run up uh, to uh, the election. Uh, and uh, the level of, uh, of security uh, intimidation uh, led to uh, a number of deaths uh, of uh, protesters uh, in uh, mid-November. Um, uh, the elections uh, were not uh, the kind that one would expect uh, of a country uh, uh, like Uganda. And uh, they certainly um, did not indicate uh, or reflect uh, a uh, free, uh, fair, and transparent process. I see. Okay, and Ambassador Gavin, a quick word about Tanzania. The late President Magufuli was a COVID-19 denier. It looks like they're turning that around now and accepting the vaccine. I believe also that the, re the Islamic rebels in Northern Mozambique are based in Southern Tanzania. This is a personal opinion, but how do you feel about Tanzania these days? I think it's a really interesting moment for Tanzania um, <coughs> given the leadership change and the sort of um, modest, uh, but interesting early steps on the part of the new president to, um, turn the country in a slightly different direction, both in terms of the COVID pandemic, uh, but perhaps also around media freedoms, some of the other uh, restrictions on political space that had been imposed under President Magafuli. So um, certainly uh, wherever they're based, the, the uh, insurgents uh, wreaking such havoc in Northern Mozambique have carried out raids in Tanzanian territory. They have serious security issues to concern themselves with. Um, there's an important you know, set of governance questions about whether or not political space will continue to be closed or, or, or um, whether there'll be a, an opening um, and a more uh, uh, democratic dispensation uh, in the country. And, and then what role you know, Tanzania really wants to play uh, regionally. So, I think it's a, a moment to watch uh, very carefully. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that the new president uh, has a difficult challenge in trying to bring uh, the ruling party along in any kinds of reforms, um, uh, but also an important opportunity to, to right a ship that had been going uh, a, bit, a bit wrong. I see. Okay. I think we've. We've come to the end of our time, and I just want to say to our friends in Kenya, I'm sorry we didn't talk about Kenya, but I just want to say, Kwahiri Yakuanana. We'll talk about you later. And thank you very much to our wonderful panelists, Ambassador Jody Carson and Ambassador Michelle Gavin. You've been outstanding in giving us your insights. And I, one final conclusion, there will be no unemployment about the Horn of Africa in the State Department in the coming months and years. So thank you very much and bye-bye. Well, I just wanna thank everyone also for participating today. Thank you to again, second what um, Ambassador Cohen said and his mention of Kenya makes me realize um, there is so much more to discuss that we definitely will have more programs. But I think the um, complexity of the situation uh, in the region and the enormity of the human uh, crisis, humanitarian crisis, makes me really glad that I could hear you know, the perspectives of all three of you. So thank you to Ambassador Cohen, Ambassador Carson, Ambassador Gavin, and also thank you to all our participants. Um, we had a really great number of good questions. That's another reason to have another program. And again, I encourage all of you who are new to the National Committee to please go to our website at ncfp.org and get an idea of all the great work that we're doing. So thanks again to all our panelists, and uh, we look forward to more discussion. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.